It's an uncomfortable reality for all of us that our experience of the world is shaped by thoughts that we don't necessarily put into words. I remember the first time I thought that. I was in a house uh, with my best friend at the time, and I said something along those lines, and I said, isn't that crazy? I just, had, I just had a thought, something that had previously just been known in my mind, but I just thought it in words. And he said, what? <laughs> and we went around in circles for a little while, trying to, trying, to, trying to come across this idea of having ideas in your mind that you don't necessarily verbalize, you don't necessarily have in words. And actually, we couldn't really get anywhere until I did this. So this bit requires a little bit of audience participation. You have to catch a ball. So, all right. <laughs> Catch. First time. Uh, a, sit catch. B, did you at any point during that think the words, that ball is going to come down because of gravity? Right, actually, and so neither had my friend, and I suspect neither did anyone else in here. And I hadn't either at the time. My point is that there are these things going on in our mind all the time. All the time, these things that are just facts for how the world works around us. They're things we made up when we were kids, and then we made them into rules, and then those rules just became axioms of existence for us. Unquestioned and unquestionable. Now, actually, for some of us, some stuff more damaging can, than that can get into those kind of ideas. For some of us, something as damaging as you are a worthless person can get into that kind of axiom of existence, where it's unquestioned and unquestionable. In 2011, I tried to kill myself. I'd spent many years wanting to and not. I'd come close a couple of times, and I hadn't because of fear or shame or guilt or cowardice or whatever you want to call that. I was so utterly convinced of my own total lack of worth that redemption was impossible. I was a net negative influence on the world. I was a bad person. And I remember being so convinced of this that I found it really frustrating that my friends and my family still seemed to care about me. And I remember thinking, if I just had a switch on the side of my head or some button I could press or some kind of ET finger touch thing, where I could just show them exactly what it was like to be in my mind, they'd understand. They'd understand how awful both I and my existence in this world were and not just understand, they'd probably agree. They'd say, actually, yeah, that sounds like it's the best thing for you. And that thundering, overwhelming river of negativity and self-hatred coursing through your mind all the time is exhausting to try and hide. Hanging out with those friends and those family members when you're secretly pretending that you're fine, but you wish that you didn't exist, is unbelievably draining. It shrinks your window of existence. I couldn't think more than a couple of minutes ahead. I lived minute to minute, tangled in these webs of hypothetical scenarios in my head, wondering why no one else seemed to be bothered by these things. I remember reading an article on the BBC about a student's suicide and wondering how it had even made the news. Because this happens to everyone, right? All of this spiraled in my head over years and, and formed these learned behaviors and neural pathways that compound over time and make it harder and harder to break out of these, these traditions, almost. I couldn't contemplate getting better, and I certainly didn't deserve to. Now, I am aware there is something of a spoiler to that story. <laughs> <laughs> Even that I am here, obviously, alive, telling you about how close I was to once not being, right? So evidently, something did eventually change. And that turning point for me was actually about a month after I tried to take my life. And that, that subsequent month was probably the worst of my entire existence. I couldn't even do that. In my mind, I just failed at the one thing that I convinced myself was going to end the string of consecutive failings that had been my whole life until that point. I struggle with these things now. We still, we still have these ideas that, that we need to keep these things internalized. We don't have space to talk about them for ourselves. And I remember after I had this, this moment, this breakdown, I was in my family home. I cried for about two solid days. 
I punched a mirror in my room. It shattered everywhere. I bled all over my floor. And eventually, my mum took me out for a drive. And actually, it took all of that stuff for us to realize that the world that my mum saw for me and the world that I saw for myself were two entirely separate things. And I can remember that car ride even now. I can remember the conversation almost word for word, because it was the first time I'd ever tried to articulate any of this stuff, any of what I've said to you. And my overriding memory of that is of this intense pressure of this real crippling pressure that you get exactly one shot to articulate this to your mum in a car that you've not wanted to exist for the last five years. And that only you can explain it because only you are going through it. I'm here to say that actually it's that last bit, it's that pressure that is both problematic, incredibly damaging, and also entirely changeable. Let me take you back to that ball for a second. I can remember exactly where I was the first time I thought the words, I can't see my life going in any fashion other than one where I let down everyone I've ever loved or cared about. It was about six months after that initial breakdown. I'd had a lot of talking therapy, I'd had a lot of conversations with friends. And actually, that was a huge, huge moment for me. Because actually, a couple of seconds after that was the first time I'd ever thought in my adult life, maybe that won't be the case. Maybe I won't live a life where I let down everyone I've ever loved and cared about. And I'd have never got to that stage where I could talk about these things, where I could articulate these things in my mind, where I could form these thoughts in words, if I hadn't been able to talk about this with friends and with counselors and with doctors. Because talking about mental health is the single biggest thing I ever did in my recovery from all of this stuff. It turns out that talking about mental health is that switch that I was looking for on the side of my head. It's not as easy as a switch. It's definitely not as easy. It's taken me like six or seven years to get to this stage, but you can learn it. And ultimately, it's the only way you get to compare minds with people. I took a year out after I had that breakdown. I took a year out, and I lay on a sofa, and I tried not to kill myself for a year. And eventually, I came back to my undergraduate geography degree. And I asked my supervisor, is there any chance I can do my dissertation on depression? Because it's basically the only thing I care about, and rivers are really boring. <laughs> and he said, he said, yeah, that's kind of fine, but you're going to have to teach yourself all those stats that you didn't turn up for. I was like, all right, give me a minute. And so I did. And it turned out that I was pretty decent at stats. It turned out I was actually pretty good at stats good enough to be offered a PhD in doing exactly that, in looking at how we measure and how we define mental health across the UK using statistics and working out who is most at risk. And it's during this PhD that this idea of being able to articulate your own suffering becomes really crucial and has real-world implications. Because my thesis is looking at self-rated mental health across the UK. That is, going out and asking people how they feel. And we do that with a batch of these statements. We have positive statements and we have negative statements. And we say, do you feel good? Do you feel bad? And then we combine them all into a score. And that fundamentally is not just measuring people's mental health, it's also measuring their capacity to talk about their mental health. Now, as you may gather, I am very, very aware of the conversations I've had about my mental health. But this is, this is like looking at a distilled version of 250,000 people's mental health and the conversations they've had about theirs. And actually, in this research, the overwhelming consensus is that the people having the worst time in the UK right now are young, unmarried, white women. And that is a really important finding. And it's a really important finding for two reasons. The first of those is that those people are obviously suffering, and we should invest in them. We should prioritize them in our policy. Government should step up and invest and put mental health on the map. The second reason why that's super important and really interesting is that that's directly contradictory to what we tend to find when we look at so-called clinical measures of mental health, stuff like suicides. I suspect it isn't news to at least some of you in here that if you are a man in the UK and you are under the age of 45, your single greatest risk of death is suicide. The same is true of ethnic minorities and migrants. 
These are people who suffer a disproportionate burden of suicide, but when we ask them how they're feeling, they say, fine. And I'm not trying to speculate on who has the worst mental health here. I actually suspect no one can answer that question objectively because we don't even agree on a definition. I'm just here to highlight that difference. That difference between those people at the real raw end of this stuff who can't articulate how they're feeling. And actually, this has real, real world implications. The whole thing becomes even more interesting when you take the concept of well being, which is relatively recent in quantitative mental health literature. So, in that, we tend to only, if you remember these positive statements and negative statements, if we take away the negative ones and we just ask people if they're feeling good, in that, then there's no difference between men and women. So, if there is some kind of stoicism, if there is some kind of internal need to say that we're fine when we're not, it's not expressed uniformly across all these things. It's expressed in when we're asked if we're feeling bad. We'll say that we don't feel good, but we won't say that we feel bad. And actually, that means that we can't be confident when we're prioritizing who we should help with mental health funding, with mental health research, with mental health policy. And it's overwhelmingly hammered home to me as an individual and as a researcher that being stoic, saying that you're fine when you're not, presents to everyone but you as just being better. I think we actually have a societal problem when it comes to talking about feeling negative. And that comes in the form of that stoicism. It comes in the form of saying that we're fine when we know we're not. We all hear these kind of ideas growing up of, that sucks, but it could be worse. You don't get to feel bad because someone else has it worse. At least you didn't grow up in a war torn country. At least you're not a starving child. And obviously, perspective is good. But those ideas are actually pretty counterproductive because they can invalidate how people are feeling. They can make them feel as though it's somehow not legitimate. And I remember as a kid growing up, these things really hit home with me because my family, my mum is from Zimbabwe. They came over here in the 60s, fleeing what was essentially apartheid conditions. And so globally, the opportunities and the privileges I have are not lost on me and were not lost on me as a kid. And yet the fact that I dared to feel terrible given these undeniable global opportunities I had, made me hate myself, made me feel guilty, made me feel selfish. What right do I have? And I still struggle with this sometimes, but it turns out that actually the logic underpinning these things is fundamentally flawed. Because to say you don't get to feel bad because someone else has it worse is the identical logic to saying that you don't get to feel good because someone has it better. And no one's saying that. Emotions aren't absolutes, they're not binaries. That whole kind of line of thinking implies that there are only two people in the world who get to feel good or bad, and I've done a whole thesis on it now, and I guarantee they do not know who they are. <laughs> we know that emotions don't work like that, and these things are still internalized within us. We also hear these ideas, I'm sure you've heard them, these notions of stiff upper lip or keep calm and carry on, or keep your chin up, or sometimes people chuck in gender and they're like, man up, or big boys don't cry. I'm here to say that those ideas are fundamentally flawed because they make people feel that their suffering is somehow not genuine. That whole idea of not talking about suffering is actually a reasonable coping mechanism until it's not, until you go past this tipping point and you're in crisis. And then it is the worst thing that you could have done because you have no way of articulating to anyone outside of that that you are in that zone. It's a madness. It's like if we, were, if we realized there were rising cancer rates, no one would be advocating for less screening. Talking is our early warning mechanism for these cases. It forces being stoic, saying that we're fine when we're not, forces coping into this false binary of coping totally fine and feeling the worst we've ever felt. And what's worse, and the reason that I suspect it's perpetuated this long, is that it's self-selecting. Because we all feel negative whether we talk about it or not. So those people who are advocating for talking less, for the stiff upper lip, have undeniably been through some stuff. They just have no idea how far along this they were, how close they were to that crisis, because they never spoke about it. It's a bit like people who have no idea how well this could work for anyone else, advocating that it should work for everyone, despite not knowing how close they were to it not working for them. 
I think of it a little bit like this. If I took everyone in here and blindfolded you all and whisked you off in some kind of secret evil genius helicopter or something, and I line you all up nine meters in front of the edge of a cliff, you don't know there's a cliff there, you've been blindfolded. And I walk along the line of all of you, and I give you all a number between one and 10. And I tell you, that's how many meters you're going to have to walk. It doesn't matter how long you take to do it, but you have to walk it. Invariably, some of you will fall off that cliff. But then the most baffling thing happens, which is how everyone who stays on the cliff starts turning around and chatting to each other about how blindfolds are the best thing ever. And we should invest in blindfolds, and we should have more blindfolds for everyone. I'm one of the people who fell off that cliff. And I've spent quite a while getting back up it. And now I'm back at the top-ish. Now I'm back at the top-ish. I'm just here yelling, screaming, begging with all of you to take the blindfold off. Because that cliff is there for all of us. I don't doubt that some of you in this room have been close to it, felt close to it. I don't doubt that some of you in this room have been close to it and not realized it was there. But it's not worth discovering it's there by falling off it. And we, we like to entertain these notions that we maybe don't need to talk because we'd be able to spot it if it was in someone close to us. We'd be able to work out that it was happening to them. But no one spotted me. And that's not because of negligence on any part. I have an incredibly loving family. I have very caring friends. It's because I couldn't spot myself. I didn't know I was unusual because no one else ever speaks about their mental health. So if you're not going to talk about your mental health for yourself because you feel fine, talk about it for someone else, someone who may not be able to speak about it, because they might realize that it isn't it for them. Because ultimately, talking about your mental health, you talking about your mental health, is not just good for you. It's good for everyone. Thank you.